Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching fanboy. 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 Uh, fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Uh, um. <laughs> This afternoon, we're going to have some fun with a family film that was shot entirely in the Bahamas. Uh, it's received recognition from the Dove Foundation and the Coalition of Quality Children's Media, uh, which we don't see too much these days of uh, people caring what the, kids, you know, what the kids are watching. But we're talking about Dolphin Island with Mike Disa and Sheked Berenson. I, I butcher your last name, so please forgive me. You no, you did that right. That was perfect. Well, the, the cool thing is that this was all filmed in the Bahamas. You have, uh, you have subtitles that are going to be in English, Sp uh, Latin American, Spanish, and then Hebrew. And then uh, on, on top of that, there's a mini 16-minute uh, documentary slash study guide that goes along with it with uh, uh, Annette Duncan. Right. Uh, what was the desire to make a family film since it seems uh, so far-fetched these days that people aren't necessarily paying attention to what's going on with the kids? Well, it really started um, from Hurricane Durian. And I released uh, a film that was shot in the Great Bahama Island um, a few years ago. And then I was talking to Mike about the opportunities there, and especially with, with having open water dolphins, which is... I think maybe there is places in Mexico that, that do that, but basically, you know, areas that dolphins, um, they do live in open water and then they come back and, uh, and interact with the people in, in the sanctuary. Um, so I was talking to Mike about it. Mike and I worked in several projects together, including um, Space Dogs, which is an animation franchise for kids. And, um, and I think a bunch of other things. And we're trying to figure out a way to help the, the economy in, uh, in the Bahamas after, you know, Hurricane Durian really devastated uh, the island. And, you know, maybe Michael um, get into it a little bit uh, later. But when, we're, when we were, when they were in December uh, location scouting, you know, we just saw the devastation. And I don't think people realize, but half the island was actually underwater because a, a wave went from one side to another, which means that everything that you own had water in it at some point, you know, your family pictures, your computer, car, uh, really anything that you have in the world. Um, and it starts with poor people for, to be, begin with, right? So it's not like they have they had a great starting point before that. So we spoke with the government seeing how we can help. And they really encouraged us to, um, they didn't want charity, they wanted to, to, um, to encourage the economy over there. And the idea was to bring the production over there, try to hire as much local people, uh, bring experts from um, LA or Hollywood to teach people how to do things, bring equipment, um, and really stimulate the economy and maybe teach people also um, a trade and show off uh, the Bahamas, what a beautiful, uh, great vacation place it is. Their main economy is um, tourism and Hurricane Duran really heard that and what we didn't know that the month after we came back from production uh the pandemic hit which also stopped all cruise lines and all the the tourism uh again so uh we're lucky to be in that small window to bring uh, both money and and bring work the people on the ground because you know it's been a tough couple of years for them for sure yeah uh, and as far uh, as family films go um Shaked and i have made many films together and our philosophy has always been um, a good film, like we want to make is for the whole family. It means it's for mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and the kids. And I think too often these days is that a family film is either, you know, geared completely towards children, which, you know, means mom and dad don't want to sit through it, or it's got some inappropriate stuff just tossed into it just to make it a little edgier, a little more adult. And we just strongly feel that you can tell a really good story. You know, you can tug heartstrings, you can laugh and you can do it with the whole family. And uh, that's, that's what we did with this, with this project. It's, it's really for, it's a classic film for the whole family, like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang or those great films we grew up watching with our families during holidays. So that's what we wanted to do. 
Well, I had a friend that wasn't allowed to watch Chitty Chitty Bang Bang because that that phrase from the title uh, has a different euphemism in uh, in Sicily. Well, I don't know. <laughs> it was written by the guy who wrote James Bond. So, right. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> but okay, but any film like that, Wizard of Oz, okay. anything. These right. there are there's a tradition of great family films where you know everybody can watch them together, and that's what we wanted to do. And you know that's kind of been the the vibe of my career is to do films that keep everybody interested, which means it's smart and it works on more than one level, but also that, you know, kids sitting there can, you know, enjoy the dolphins and the adventure and the fun while the parents are getting something different out of it. Right. Why do you think the family films have gone in those two different extremes of either it's for five and under, or it's for the, uh, you know, there's too many adult jokes that might go over the kids heads. And if it doesn't now you got to start to worry. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, <laughs> some of which I could go into. Uh, my 10 years at Disney taught, you know, got me and my independent family films have taught me a lot about the business model. But I think a lot of it has to come down to the fact that people consume media individually now. Um, you, you just pull out your phone and you consume your own media. Even families will sit around in a room together all consuming their own media. And that's fine, but there's something missing in the experience of sitting down as a family, you know, putting your kid on your lap and have, you know, hugging them while you watch an, an, ex an emotional experience together. That's a beautiful part about growing up. And it's a great part about being a family unit. And uh, I think just the, the way we consume media is kind of making those projects like that, film experiences like that more rare. But that's what we wanted to do. We want a film where like you can sit down and you can watch a movie, but you can also have some quality time with your family. And what does it mean to get the, the Dove approval for a film? Because uh, typically people associate the Dove Foundation with more religious films than they do with, with family films. Well, the Dove Foundation is just concerned about not having things in the film that would be inappropriate for the family, which again, it's just a basic trust issue. As a filmmaker, if we say we're making a family film, you're inviting us into your home. And if we come into your home, we're going to respect it. <laughs> you know, we're not going to try to slip, at least Chickhead and I, we're not going to try to slip something in there to show how cool we are to our friends. We are respecting the fact that your family is there watching it together and we're not going to put anything in this film that's inappropriate. And that's what the Dove Foundation is concerned about. Um, yes, they tend to find religious films more appropriate because they're concerned about that but there's absolutely no reason why um, a secular film a film like ours uh, that actually talks about values and strong family relationships and you know love and doesn't settle you know every argument with a fight <laughs> um, uh, there's no reason why a religious a, a religious audience and a secular audience couldn't both get something out of this project because it's about families it, yeah. We all have families. You know? And I'm not picking on religious projects by any means. I no. have a master's degree in theology myself, so uh, you know, I'm quite familiar with that. It's just that usually they go that route, so I was surprised with the secular film they decided to uh, pay attention to it as well. I, well, you know, they and, do go hand in hand, but really when you look at those organizations, like Mike said, it's about values and about um, showing, teaching the kids something positive. Um, as opposed to, uh, as you know, a lot of what happened in the media, it's um, sensationalized, right? So you, you need to show blood or you need to, you know, have the main lead dies or something just to grab attention. And, and I feel that um, if you want something that's safe for the entire family, it's kind of somehow go hand in hand in our business, but it really shouldn't. And when you look at, at the production itself, I mean, um, we had... Uh, I was just putting up data because um, we end up being having a very diverse um, type of production. We actually had over 50% minorities. Um, we had uh, over 30% uh, women, uh, over 50% non-white. And I'm talking both in front and behind the camera. And also, um, also uh, two queer members representative so if you you tell me like hey let's go make a christian movie you know uh, and, and you think to yourself like oh it's like a white middle america you know non-diverse kind of um 
content, uh, this one is not. I mean, we, we basically have two interracial couples in the center of the story. So uh, I think, and it's all, for us, it was all created naturally because we wanted to be in the Bahamas and show the flavors and, and the local people. And, and that's what happened. It was not specifically by design. Uh, by design was to try to make, like Mike said, a film that works both for the um, for the kids, but also for the parents and the grandparents. And I feel, at least for me, was the hardest challenge. I mean, when we um, starting with the script through the production and especially in editing, you know, to to navigate that, like, well, the more serious stuff we put for the adults, the more it becomes less fun for the kids. Okay, let's make it more fun for the kids, but then it becomes kind of silly for the adults and to find that middle ground is just extremely, extremely hard. And it's probably the most challenging uh, thing uh, Mike and I has to deal with. I think, I think it was funny when you say you make a Christian film and it's white but middle America since the, since our foundation of Christianity all started in the Middle East. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's the American perspective of it. So I completely understand that. Well, uh, it, it's also interesting too. I mean, it was, as long as we're talking about religion and movies mm -hmm. is that, you know, that, I, a, a film about a family or about somebody going through a crisis, I think it's perfectly dramatically legitimate to deal with faith, their faith in a situation like that without preaching or having an agenda because human beings rely on their faith for a lot of their decision making, for a lot of the strength that they need during crisis. So um, I think that's, it, it, it's often ignored in, in, in modern films to the point where you, you, it's a little silly. It's like, well, you know, if somebody's dying, it's just natural for someone who loves them to pray. You know, if somebody's sick or if you're scared, you know, the old saying is there's no atheists in foxholes. Well, raising a family is tough. That's and I major know foxhole. <laughs> yeah. And um, I know from experience, when my kids get sick and there's nothing I can do, you know, you get on your knees. Yeah. That, that's all you can do. And so without saying like, oh, like, you know, we're making specifically a Christian film or something like that. I think the, the concept of faith, and this is actually, there's moments like this in the movie. Um, and that's where Annette came in. Annette, uh, the actress who plays the grandmother who uh, comes into the story, um, is actually the wife of a minister. And after she was cast, she and I started talking. And she was talking to me about her faith and how, you know, how much she enjoyed the part. And she's a marvelous actress. And I just mentioned to her on the phone, I'm like, would you mind if I lean, if we rewrote the script a little bit and leaned into that in a couple of scenes? And she was like, no, I would love that. And um, uh, we had her bring a little uh, cross on a necklace. And the idea wasn't to preach or do anything like that, but there's this moment in the film where the, the, this generation, these two generations that have been separated you know, for years, grandmother and granddaughter come together and they have a conversation about the the mother who's dead and this necklace as a symbol of her faith was something that her mother has been carrying around for all these years and she gives it to her granddaughter and it's a beautiful way to visualize these these generations coming together these two people finding a common bond through you know the heart of this missing person and it happened to be a symbol of faith but it, it worked beautifully and it felt very natural and it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie it's actually just and, that, and that's what I give you guys credit for is that it's a multi-generational film as well, because as, as Mike mentioned, you know, we consume by ourselves entertainment or media or whatever else. And America has gone so far into the youth culture and it started in the 50s because that's really when the generation gap began uh, was around the was around that time with disposable income for for teenagers with with uh, with the baby boomers coming into their own that they didn't go into the field with their parents and and work the farm or, or instantly into the factory as soon as school was over type deal, that uh, we kind of lost that generational thing. And now people look at uh, their older relatives and go, oh, you're old, you're out of touch. It doesn't matter anymore. You know, your generation is a, a bygone era. And this shows the connectivity between, you know, the young, uh, the young and the old generations still having that bond. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things being a, a, a Disney animator and director and having done all these animated films is you often see the cliche of the kids being super geniuses and the parents being idiots. <laughs> you know, and somehow that's funny. And I've never found that to be true. What I always find is that children are brilliant in their way um, and adults have wisdom to share. And we all have 
faults and we all make mistakes, but that's part of being humanity. That's not specific to a particular age. And so when we make a family movie, we like to treat everybody as a real person with respect, which means, you know, everybody has something to share. A family dynamic works the way it does because that's how it was designed to work. They're supposed to be young people and old people, you know, and different types of people. And because when we come together, we all have different skills at different parts of our lives. And, and, and that's what makes a family work. That's why when we break apart, when we individualize, things don't work as well. We need each other at all points in our lives. And again, that's the kind of film we wanna make without preaching. Well, you guys, you guys are doing great and, you know, you got to go on vacation while, while working, in a sense, being <laughs> in the Bahamas. Yeah. Um, the Bahamas are actually wonderful. As Shaquette said, they've been going through some difficult uh, stuff, but the people yeah. were, I mean, just so kind and so strong. I mean, just global warming is just kicking the, the bejesus out of that island. And they come back and rebuild and it's beautiful and it's a fun place to go. And it's, you know, they just are remarkable, remarkable, strong, kind people. And so if anybody really is thinking about their post-COVID vacation, <laughs> the Bahamas is right there and they're going to love to have you. And they're the nicest people on earth. Right. And the food is amazing. It's conk. <laughs> uh, for Shaked, because I know you've made horror films. I know you've made action adventure films. And now this is a family film. Is there a difficulty in transitioning from writing or directing, uh, you know, a more adult-based film and then going more family-orientated? Or is it the idea of, you know, this is the movie I'd want to watch when the kids go to bed versus this is the movie I want to watch with my parents and my children all in the same room? So, um, well, first of all, I know I'm, I'm mainly known in the horror space, but actually I've been in the family space for many, many years. You know, uh, Mike and I, like I, I said at the beginning, we worked on um, uh, two Space Dogs uh, movies and two TV series related to that franchise. Uh, we also, uh, I made a film called Tiger's Tale many years ago. So, you know, I've always been in the family space too. I find... For me, the process of filmmaking is really about people. So if I'm making, you know, I made dramas before, um, it, it really doesn't matter um, what type film, it's more for me about putting the people together in the vision and making everything work. Um, and when you create that environment is, is like we discussed, it's like everything that we've done in the movie was basically done to be authentic to the location, be authentic to the characters, be authentic to the actors playing those characters. And then it comes together in a wonderful way. And I think that's true both for genre films and for family movies and for drama. Um, so um, I, I don't find it to be more of a transition. Um, it, it's also not more of the same because obviously there is other production challenges that maybe on a horror movie, you don't gonna have as much as on a family film, um, um, mainly in terms of special effects and and VFX, although we did have, you know, the bolt on fake fire and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, you know, in Tales of Halloween, we worked with kids, you know, we had two animals there, one my dog, one Excel's Caroline dog. Um, we had, you know, we, we, you know, we find ourselves work um, with kids and animals on, on both sides of the aisle. So um, I, I find it a very clear and, and easy transition. And I'm asking these types of questions because so many people have been so far removed from, from everything, whether it's been their families, whether it's been their faith, whether it's been anything else, that when I see something that gets that, that dove stamp, you know, it's, it's refreshing because it's not to the point of, uh, it's going to be one of those things that I can't watch with my kids, you know, and I'll just put it on as their babysitter versus uh, I can't watch it because it's too adult for the kids. This is just something that you can watch and enjoy and then escape for an hour and a half to two hours. Mm -hmm. Right, Fam what used to be the, the most common <laughs> form of filmmaking made is um, a straightforward family um, action comedy, um, which you know, means that it works for everybody. Um, I, think, I think we it would be wonderful if we had more films like that being made to be honest, you know, because a lot of Disney films and cartoons are either geared really for just kids and it's there it's hard for an adult to sit through or they're just dirty you know and, and it's supposed to be you know shocking um but well mike have... you've killed enough parents with your disney film so we we get it yes yeah. but, <laughs> <laughs> yes i started that <laughs> but, you know, 
<laughs> no, you just kept the tradition alive. Yeah, okay. I'm, no, no, it's it's <laughs> remarkable how often that they just. Anyways, we, we I'm not going to get into that. But the um, we'll get into um, it off the record. It's okay. yeah. There we go. But you know, if there was more content that you could watch together. Now, Shaked just had his first baby, and uh, and he's kept his figure marvelously. But Shaked just had his first child, and you know he's just entering the part of his life where you know you're going to want to spend as much time with your children as you want as you can. Um, because once they become teenagers, you know, it, it's, you know, they're starting their own lives. That's where my kids are now. And um, it's, it's wonderful if there's, if there's media out there that you can watch together. You know, you can have that shared experience. And then afterwards, maybe talk to them a little. Because there are, in uh, any kind of action drama, there are, you know, issues that maybe it, it, you can take this as a learning, learning moment, teaching moment with your children and talk a little bit about it. You know, respect for animal life, respect for the dolphins. You know, res you know, respect for other creatures. Um, what it's you know the the kind of conflicts families have and how they can solve them in a positive and loving way. Um, why not? I wish there was more media, which we could just sit down together and just be part of a community together, even if it's as small as a family. And we really are atomizing. We're we're breaking apart as a culture. I saw some statistics the other day that say we've never been more separated. You know, we've never been more apart. We've never been more depressed. Um, we've never been more anxious. And Shaked and my mission in life is to fix that. <laughs> we we want to come into your house with a good movie you're all going to like and let you sit down and be together. And at the end, and, and you're going to, it's optimistic, it's hopeful, but it's also real. And um, that's what I think we need a lot more of in our media. I mean, less giant robots, more people loving each other. Well, it, it's kind of gotten to the point that everything in the last 10 years has been just pure dystopian and all hope has, is lost. You know, we had the Maze Runner series. We had uh, the Divergent series. We've had the, um, what was that one? Uh, uh, divided into little sections and whatever else, the haves and the have nots and uh, Hunger Games, oh. you know, all, all that stuff. So that seemed to have been the trend is like teenage dystopia. And it, it kind of has like those 1970s movies, you know, late 60s, where if you're over 30, nobody trusts you type deal. There's also, the market has a lot to do with that. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is adults don't consume nearly as much media as teenagers. Um, also, um, when you get out of college or when you're in high school for the first time and you've got your first credit card, that's when you're going to go spend money on that stuff. You know, you're going to go to movies and you're going to consume media. So what's happened is Hollywood has entirely focused their business model. Um, you, you'll notice there's very little being made for, you know, children anymore. Well, children don't have credit cards and can't sign up for streamers. So what they want is Hollywood just wants the stuff that you're going to get, you know, a 20 year old, with a credit card, you know, and, and it, we call it the cool factor with a K, you know, the kids, go, oh, they go, oh, that looks cool. I'm going to watch that. And, you know, that's, that's the Hollywood business model. And, you know, by the way, you know, take a look around. That's, that's not, that's not sustainable. <laughs> like Hollywood is having its own problems right now. Um, so that's why movies like that are made. It, it, there's a business model. The great thing about Shaked is as an independent producer and distributor, he can actually take chances on other films, other kinds of films. He can he can look for a family market, and say you know let let's make a little film for a family market, and um, that's some, that's kind of the the horror business too. That's remarkable, you know I, you know I I, I work on giant budget films all the time. You know if you look at my resume, I worked on hundred million dollar movies constantly, and but I can't go to Disney or. Warners and say, I want to make a little dolphin movie. I want to make a movie in the Bahamas, you know, that brings some joy to that place about a family, you know, and I want it to stir a little dolphin. And they're like, they're never going to let me make a movie like that. <laughs> she she is willing to take chances on that. Um, we do have the big budget version of this where the uh, dolphin is a cyborg killing machine. That one was, is coming out in a few weeks. But um, is that going to be the sequel to uh, Turbo Kid, uh, Shaked? Um, no, because Turbo Kid is actually um, owned by the filmmakers and uh, <laughs> so there's always the business on the side. But uh, but we might put Skeletron, you know, 
as an extra somewhere, you know, for the fans to look for it. Right. You know, it, it's going to be one of those like spiritual sequels that aren't directly related type deal. I get it. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, but I agree, Hampson. It is kind of interesting how, you know, studios or streamers that makes billions, you know, at this point, it's billions a month. It used to be billions a year. Now it's billions a month. Um, they would not, you know, spend a million dollars taking a risk on a small movie or try to do something original. Um, and you need to have individuals that can lose their house and everything that they have in order to do those. And it's really strange. That's how our, our industry is, is positioned right now. You know, it's like you can't, you know, you can't allocate, you know, 0.00001% of your monthly income to, uh, uh, to try to, you know, make indie films. But when you look at what's coming out from the Disney's and the Netflix of this world, unless it's a known IP, it's not getting made, right? So it has to be uh, a book that is a bestseller or they just recycle any TV show, you know, Full House, whatever they can find to re-option and, and, and remake and relaunch uh, just because of the awareness, uh, which, you know, yeah, I, I, I mean, they do it because it works, I guess, because, you know, uh, I want to believe that if, if there was money making more indie films and, and more original films, then they would do, would have done it. But um, it's funny they call it Netflix original or like the word original is really thrown on all this stuff that's not original, you know, and there was no uh, screenwriter uh, or director that kind of came up or producer that came up with the concept and started from scratch as an original film. Uh, I don't know, maybe it'd be interesting to look at the previous few years of the Oscar uh, nomination for original script and kind of see see that shift too, you know, and see who, who are the people that making those movies get nominated for original script. Sure. Um, well, you know, know. Unless, unless they count, you know, the fifth, um, you know, um, A Star is Born as an original, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know, you know, I don't yeah, know what, what are the definitions. This is true of America right now. It's it's been monopolized. You know, every, everything has been bought up. You know, our media has been bought up. Our food distribution. Our, you know, everything has been bought up by these giant corporations. And so there's only really Hollywood is really just four companies now. Um, that's just it. You know, it used to be hundreds of independent filmmakers. You know, now basically you have these four colossuses who just make you know who do literally monopolize distribution and everything. So, like for instance, if you don't want to watch an uh, Iron Man movie, too bad. <laughs> you are going to watch an Iron Man movie. You, you, you will not be able to escape it. Um, so when people support films like Dolphin Island, you know, you're, you're not just enjoying a family experience. You're also helping fix the problem with, with, with American business media, which is the fact that, you know, if, if small movies can be profitable, you know, we're not talking about buying somebody a home in Malibu, but if they can, if they can be supported, if they can find an audience, if the people listening to this watch the movie, they should feel good in more than one level. Because what you're doing is it, it's it's like supporting the American farmer, the family farmer. You know? It's it's you're supporting independent filming industry that will present you with more options than just another Iron Man movie. Yeah, um, and. If our art is better, if our culture is better, you know, then we'll be happier and we'll be a better society. And the more things compress and, you know, get, get bought up and, you know, they're, like I said, only four companies, which means there's basically four guys <laughs> deciding about all the media that's produced in America right now. Um, uh, the more that happens, the less variety, yeah. you know, the less surprises you're going to see in your art, in your media, in your culture. Uh, the more we support small filmmakers, the more variety and the more surprises you're going to have in your life. Well, with that said, that if is anybody's listening to this, who is at M&A &A department at Disney or something, I am open to be purchased. <laughs> Happy to have my company or my library being uh, bought out. Um, Spoken yeah, like I'm a not. true immigrant, uh, kid. I love it. <laughs> you're, you're more American than Americans at this point. Yeah, he's got the, he's got the new kid. But my kids are growing. I have a new kid. I need to start saving for college for him. So please. Exactly. You know? Well, no, I had I had a private conversation about this with somebody, and I'm not going to say who it was because you know they're going to listen to this and go, "Yeah, I know you're talking about me." But um, voting with your dollars has become very important, and this person has not liked uh, what is it? We've have eleven Star Wars movies now. 
something like that. So let's say 11 Star Wars movies. One good one, but okay. Yeah, but he's only like the original three and kind of Rogue One. And I'm like, okay, so what's the deal? Is like, why did you buy all the Star Wars movies and then go back to the theater and saw the re-release of Phantom Menace if you hated Phantom Menace so much? Well, I like Star Wars and I want to support the property. But if the property is something you don't like beyond three movies, why are you watching the other eight? Well, I like Star Wars. Clearly you don't because you hate eight of the 11 movies. Yeah. So, it, but they, they realize that they can go after that fanboy market that will hate watch everything. Mm -hmm. And that, and that seems to where, where we've been, because if people aren't voting with their dollars, people are still going to get the same thing because like, Oh, I hated it. But did you watch it? Well, yeah. Well, are you going to watch it again? Well, yeah. Well, that's your fault because you've bought into it more. So nothing's going to change if you don't vote with your dollars. So as Mike is saying, vote with your dollars and support independent film because that's where the real art is going to be made, whether it's going to be a family film or a horror film or animated feature or whatever else. Well, you're, what you're talking about um, is relatively recent, I guess, in the last 10 years, um, with big budget live action films. But it's been something that's been going on in animation for decades. Uh, one of the things, the reason I left the big studios and started making independent animated films, and I've done more independent theatrically released animated films than anybody other than Don Bluth and Ralph Bakshi, you know, so, and I've also worked in these big studio films. And when we were in the studio film, we were, we were in the studio, um, we used to get together and talk and like, does it feel like we're making the same movie over and over again, slightly less well each time? <laughs> you know, and it was like, you know, yes. And then we'd get excited and they'd tell us what the next film is we were working on. And we'd all sit down and watch the storyboards and walk away and go, it's the same movie not as good, you know, but more expensive, but not, not as good. And um, that became a thing in animation where, you know, um, every animated film that came out was pretty much the same thing. You knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, occasionally they might throw a nice song in there and then everybody gets real excited because, you know, for just the three and a half minutes, you're not, you don't know exactly what the next lyric's going to be, but for the rest of the film, you know, you, I mean, you just see it all coming. Um, and what happened was, is that people would still go, the animation fans would still go to see these horrible animated movies and hate them and talk about how they're the same thing over and over again. Um, and then they wouldn't go see these indie uh, animated films that were produced in a far smaller budget in theaters. They'd wait to, you know, to see those on home video and stuff. And you'd ask why. It's like, why are you going to see the movie that you, you're, you're just going to hate because it's a, another McDonald's Happy Meal you know, fed to you by a corporation that you know what, the, you know, it's, you know, it's just trying to sell dresses to young girls. It's just trying to sell princess dresses. Why do you want to go see it instead of going off to see the indie films when they come out? And it was the same thing. No, no, I have to go see this one because I hate it. And I, I, have, I have to go see the big one. Um, I have to go see the one that's being, you know, made by the, the big corporation. I just have to see that. And then I'll try to see the other ones later. And I'm, you never, you, you're like, well, that's how we ended up with a, a crashed animation industry. And now animated films are so boring and so predictable because that's the business model. You know, at no point did we train the people making this stuff to surprise us or to do good work or to add, add variety to it. Um, and if you don't train people to do that, they won't do it, so especially corporations. You know, they only do what's worked in the past. Well, I mean, I love a lot of the Marvel movies and I love indie films. Like I can go back and forth between the scale. And <clears throat> COVID has kind of shown us that we don't necessarily need the theater anymore because there's been so, so much coming out on demand. And the Disney has done their pay-per-views through Disney+. Plus, and I think H, uh, what's it called? Warner Brothers released everything on HBO Max. Just their whole slate for two years is coming straight to HBO Max. What does that do to independent filmmakers if... Now the big boys are going the same route as the indie filmmakers and going to on demand. I should, should talk about this, but I'll, I'll just, it crushes them. It crushes them. It drives small independent filmmakers out of the market. Netflix has not been good for film. Netflix has been good for a few stockholders, but it has crushed the indie market. You know, you get, you know, People get their films released on Netflix. They're not making much money. You know, that's only the big fancy actors with the CAA deals. Um, the streamers and now the uh, 
I, I don't want to say death, but the uh, the possible mortal wounding of of the theaters is bad news. But you know, Shaked lives in that world, so I'll let him talk about it. Yeah, the the other side of what I do is from distribution. So uh, we we distribute um, a company, Temet Squad. We manage the distribution for several labels, including the horror collective. So we're very much in in the transactional world. We're very much selling to the Netflixes and the Hulus of this world and the Shutters of this world. And you definitely seen a, a shift, which especially streamers like Netflix. At the beginning, they were buying uh, third party content and indie content. Uh, basically to fill the slots, right? And now they're a lot more pickier. They're basically not picking up anything besides the stuff they're making themselves. Um, like you say, a lot of the, the studio uh, films crowd, crowding that space. I think what people forget is they want to believe that the internet opened and, and made a much accessible that anybody can find any movie. But in the end of the day, it's actually the opposite because um, if, if you, let's say your movie is on iTunes, right? and um, it's not in the top 10 or whatever it is on the front page, nobody's going to transact on your movie, right? So the movies that are like new releases or now in theaters or whatever the category, they make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars each. And the one that like on page two, they make zero, right? It's almost like Google, right? I mean, if, if we start a business and we're in the first page of Google, we're billionaires. If you're in page number two, we bankrupt, right? So it's the same thing. So it actually made the, self, the shelf space much smaller um, we don't have the blockbuster kind of, you know, big room that you could just spend 45 minutes just sorting through little DVDs and finding something from from uh, obscure distributor or filmmaker. So, uh, yeah, it does pushes the entertainment, the, the indie films out. Um, Amazon start purging a lot of the, the indie uh, movies uh, out of their system as well. It does create opportunities for other people um, to start their own um programs and, and we're launching different OTT channels um, shortly, you know, for different uh, subgenres and different types of fans. But in the end of the day, it really is depends on what the, the audience decide to pay for, right? So I was talking with one, I'm not going to mention which, but I was talking with one of the, the transactional, um, uh, very known, very big, one of the biggest transactional VOD platforms. And they said that they analyzed the last year um, numbers and about half of the revenue came from less than 5% of their content, right? So less than 5% of the movies made them half of the income. So just think about that. It's, you know, if you, that type of, of um, uh, uh, distributor, like why would you spend the time and the money to actually look for, acquire, ingest, promote the other 95 of the movies. If anyway, the Disney stuff is the stuff that's going to make you most of the income. You know, you'd be doing much better with just having those five movies instead of having 500 movies um, from other people, which is a tough, you know, it's tough to hear and a tough uh, pill to swallow, but it's all of our fault, you know, and when, you know, we look around this, you know, virtual room and Zoom, like when was the last time, you know, we actually paid for an indie movie as compared to when was the last time we gave ten dollars to Netflix and, and Disney, you know, and I bet that most people we know give them money every month, even if they don't watch anything, they still give them the twelve dollars or whatever it is subscription. Uh, but when it comes to see an indie movie that they maybe heard about, I don't know how they go online and it's five ninety nine and they go like, eh, I'll just watch something I can, you know, that's always included in my subscription. And we see it a lot. We see. When we advertise a movie like Dolphin Island coming back to it, we see on Facebook, people say like, you know, this is bullshit. I need to pay for it again. You know, I need to pay for it. Like how come I need to pay for it on Amazon? And what they don't realize that we're not Amazon. We actually pay half of our fee to Amazon just for the, you know, privilege of being on their platform. Uh, but, and then we spend marketing money to push people to their business, you know, for the richest person on earth, right? Um, and then people complain and say that we're not okay because we need to charge two ninety nine to to watch the movie that you know we worked so hard to make. So, um, so it's all really come back to to consumer behavior. And it's not about quality either, to be honest with you, because you know one of the things we're we're talking about here is is eyes being driven through searches and through internet. And when you get onto Amazon, seeing what the first picks are and and Netflix and everything, like and those algorithms are not fair 
those algorithms are written, you know, by those companies to drive you towards their content, period. You have to really go look around. Even if you end up on the platform, you, you really have to put some effort into finding, you know, an independent movie there. And when you just do a straight Google search for an, for an indie film, that's, that algorithm is rigged too. Um, the big companies pay, pay, pay Google money, either, you know, on, this will instantly turn off now, one, but pay, pay Google money, either um, above board or under the table, to gear eyes and clicks towards their content. So the reason why, um, you know, let's say the Disney movies are generating 95% of this one distributors of this one streamers income is because it is extraordinarily difficult not to be driven to that product <laughs> you know i mean you literally have to fight it well let's push dolphin island before uh, mike gets us cut off because he set the time too short for this conversation because we could do this for another three hours i know that much but dolphin right. island comes out august 1st which i'm excited about we really need to revisit this conversation in private after the interview maybe we can we can talk soon no i, I really love talking to you guys that's the thing and, you know, Shaked's movies I've watched, uh, you know, Hoodwink 2 and there are a bunch of other stuff Mike's made as well. Um, again, Dolphin Island comes to, to DVD on, on August 1st. Where can we find the film and where can we find you guys if we want to connect with you on social media? So right now um, you can find the Dolphin Island DVD. It's, it's on discount for pre-orders. So until August 1st, it's going to be available for $9.99 and then it's going to go up to the retail, um, which I think is $14.99 on our website on dolphinislandmovie.com um, slash DVD, or, or just go to the website, you can find it. Uh, and then 100% of the, the revenue goes to us, or you can find it on Amazon, where Amazon, you know, get their fee, which is uh, quite happy. It's most of the, the margins. So I uh, encourage people, and if you can add a link uh, to our website, you know, that's the best place to find it. Uh, oh, on social man. media, I'm the easiest person, you know. My, my, nobody has my name. It's weird. It's strange. Um, but um, if you look me up on Twitter, on TikTok, on Clubhouse, um, very active in Clubhouse too. Um, but um, we, I'm available everywhere. I'm very accessible. Perfect. Well, um, you can uh, con you can continue the uh, family film revolution against the man by reaching out to me at Disa underscore Mike on Twitter or on Facebook, Mike Disa, and I I'm always happy to chat with film fans. Uh, and, and we will, using their media, we will bring down the corporate structure that has so harmed our society. Freedom and joy and peace will be everywhere. Mike, I'm going to have fun getting to know you on a personal level because we're going to talk about so much stuff off the record that I can't say publicly myself. But it's been a pleasure. Dolphin Island is available August 1st. I know Mike's looking at that, that ticker. He's like, oh, we're down to 35 seconds. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate everything. All right, guys. Thank, thank really you so much. It. it was great talking to you guys. Thank you so great much. Great talking to you, too. I'll send you guys a, a note when this goes live and everything. And then, uh, you know, again, we're, we're definitely going to keep in touch. Yeah, reach out. We'll, we'll have a virtual conversation. For sure. Are you in L.A. or are you somewhere else? I'm in L.A. Okay, I'm in Orange County, so. Oh, I mean, it doesn't matter. We're all hunkered in anyhow. <laughs> this is true. And then Shaked's back in Israel, so it's okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm actually in, um, in uh, L.A. I'm by the Hollywood Bowl. But... Um, so you're in Little Israel. Hebrew, Hebrew subtitles on the movie is for my nephews to watch. Oh, wonderful. So Shaked's in Little Israel because he's by the Hollywood Bowl, so it's perfect. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we'll talk soon, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank All you. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.